we were talking about evidence for evolution and looking at the different anatomical features that showed us how organisms were connected through common ancestry. Let's take a look at these two pictures. So just a little bit about them is these are both vertebrate animals. Their forelimbs have a humerus, a radius, and ulna, carpals, metacarpals, and phalanges. So that should clue you into trying to figure out if these structures are homologous, vestigial, or analogous. What do y'all think? Which one? Someone for you? Anybody? Okay, we got that here. A. That because they have the same four limb structure, same bone pattern, but a little bit similar, but yet different. Um, they come from a common ancestor. Homologous structures show um, divergent ancestry away from the common ancestor because they have similar features. Next piece of evidence for evolution is embryology. You started looking at embryos last week. Because evolution is based in heredity, we know that genes are going to be the things that are coding for these similar structures and that genes will code for very similar things in related organisms, just like the genes that code for the bone structure and the forelimbs of vertebrates. When we're looking at embryos in very early development, what you will see is that the more closely related two organisms are, the more similar their embryo stages will be. Even if their adult forms are going to be very different, the early stages of the embryos will look super similar if they're closely related. So, you're all smart, right? Can you tell which one's a pig and which ones are humans? Okay, so now, maybe the pig and the human, if I were to give you these images, it might be a little bit harder to determine at these early embryological stages which one is which. Um, all of the vertebrates look very similar to these. And then eventually we know that they start to become very different. So just as a general rule, Organisms who share a close common ancestor will have very similar embryonic stages. Our next piece of evidence for evolution is biogeography. So there's that BIO, it means the living things, and geography, like where do they come from? We're looking at geographic distribution of organisms. When we look at biogeography, one of the things that helps us to kind of understand why organisms have common ancestors is to look at the continents. And with continental, continental drift or shifting of the continents, we could get an understanding that a long, long, long time ago that all the continents were one landmass. And so you had organisms that lived together on the same land mass. And as those mass, masses of land started to move, it caused natural selection to occur. That when those land masses began to move and you had barriers like water between the land masses and organisms of the same population were separated by that big thing of water, they weren't able to reproduce with one another, and they began to experience the process of natural selection differently based on the land masses moving. So here, it's 
So here's a history of what our land masses or continents look like. I think this is super interesting. That they used to be almost one land mass called Pangaea, go back 250 million years ago. And then the land masses began to separate into two major land masses, Laurasia and Gondwana land. And then they started to move more. Um, this is pretty cool. All of these fit, you could see kind of like pieces of the puzzle together, especially obvious when we're looking at Africa and South America, how the Cape of Africa and the um, eastern side of South America, you can see how closely they fit together like pieces of a puzzle. The land masses are in constant movement. We don't feel them, right? They're moving at like millimeters per year. So these are very slow processes, but you do get the separation from here, one land mass, into we have one, two, three, four, five, six, six major land masses, a number of other ones in between as well, um, to present day. All right, so just some things about natural selection. When, especially in this unit, especially when you're talking about writing up Lab 22 today, and going forward, for many of you, you will take uh, maybe an evolution class or an um, eco-evo class, which is ecology and evolution. Uh, some things to just keep in your mind that when you're talking about natural selection and we're looking at traits that allow groups or individuals to survive easier than others, we call those advantageous traits. Really, really remember, do not use the terms strong and weak. Um, you should not say like this stronger trait allows this group to survive better than those with the weaker trait. We don't necessarily look at it like that, or most of the time we don't. So again, just do not use. In your futures, including today when you're writing up the lab, don't use strong and weak. Remember to use advantageous, better adapted, less well adapted, non-advantageous. So those are what you want to think about, and especially in the context of the environment. You don't want to say the stronger trait or the weaker trait. So definitely carry this with you. All right, last um, thing I want to talk about in terms of evidence for evolution. This is something that we are seeing explosions in the world of grouping organisms is through the use of molecular biology. And when we're talking about molecular biology, we could be referring to individual genes uh, or alleles. We could be talking about proteins, uh, pieces of DNA, pieces of RNA. And so it can refer to a wide variety of coding information when we're looking at different organisms. Looking at molecular biology is the most concrete way we have now of comparing organisms and showing how they're alike or unalike or maybe more distant from a common ancestor. We can look at the simple A's, T's, G's, and C's of DNA. And um, one of the things to remember that the central dogma of biology says that DNA has the instructions for, and we say proteins, but really what we mean um, in terms of the central dogma, I kind of, not kind of, I dislike that. That when thinking about this central dogma of biology, like what everything is based in, is that DNA is the instructions. And oftentimes they'll say, well, DNA is the instruction for protein. But is everything in our body made of protein? No, right? So this I like to say kind of proteins, because not everything in our body is proteins. We've got all kinds of different biomolecules that are important. So when we say proteins, we really mean, mean everything in the cell everything in the tissue of the organism, and so everything. Okay. 
So that protein can be a placeholder, whether we're talking about a biomolecule um, and what's important in a cell, which makes up tissues, organs, systems, organisms, that DNA is the instructions for that stuff, not just and only proteins. There's a whole process. If you took Bio 111, you'll probably remember this, but DNA uses RNA to go undergo a process of transcription that you make an RNA transcript or a copy and RNA of the DNA instructions and then the RNA transcript translates the DNA information into the protein or everything that's important in a cell tissue etc. So we call that translation. So we've got this transcription and translation phases to go from the instructions that DNA has of all the important stuff to an RNA transcript, which is then copied into the outcome of everything that's important. So when we are taking a look at figuring out how organisms are related, you can really use any of these steps. You can take a look at the DNA itself, the A's, T's, G's, and C's. You can look at the RNA transcripts, which would be A, U, G, and C. And then you can look at the amino acid sequence of proteins, or you can look at the monomers of other proteins, fats, lipids, nucleic acids, carbohydrates. You can really look at any biomolecule. And you can see the components and then compare between two different organisms that you're trying to figure out, are they closely related or not? Um, we can use any part of this process in molecular biology. So it's kind of cool that we have this. So one of the things that we have a study on was that scientists looked at a protein called cytochrome C. Almost every organism on the earth from unicellular organisms to complex organisms like us or other animals as well as plants and fungi, almost every organism has a cytochrome C protein. So that should in itself give you the idea that everything comes from a common ancestor that had cytochrome C, and in different environments that cytochrome C, um, it was depending on the environment, what sequence was favored or not in that organism given the current environment. So scientists can take the sequence in each organism cytochrome C and see how closely related the sequence that makes up that cytochrome C, the amino acid sequence, and you could get an idea like, oh, these must be the cytochrome C is very closely, um, has a close same pattern or not. So for example, oh, and we'll get into the example in one second. Um, also, we could isolate the gene that makes the cytochrome C or in general, we can isolate a gene in different organisms um, and look at, okay, this gene functions very similarly and then see how well the sequences match up. So kind of big picture is the more related organisms are, the more related, and, and again, depending on what we're looking at, are we looking at DNA, RNA, proteins, lipids, nucleic acids, what are we looking at? We can look at sequences within those biomolecules and then have a concrete comparison of how closely related they are or how close in time that they share a common ancestor. So I think it's fascinating. If you take a look on your page, the cytochrome sequence of a section between a human and a mouse that when we take a look at 315 nucleotides, that between a human and a mouse, this particular protein only varies by 30 nucleotides. So there's only a 10% difference in this protein between us and a mouse. Pretty interesting, right? Mice are also vertebrates. Mice also have the same four limb structure. So there's a lot of evidence, just you know, kind of other evidence that we talked about that we're close related to a mouse. They have a back like we do, they have a brain, they have a similar digestive system, so there's a lot of ways to show that, just kind of like comparing systems 
and other features, but here we can go down to a gene and show like 10% difference within this gene gives us an idea. We can do that with so many different organisms as well. So reflection on what we talked about in this chapter about evidence for evolution, that a major trend in evolution is that blank forms give rise to blank forms. So is it larger forms give rise to smaller forms? Is that consistent? No, not necessarily. I mean, sometimes and then sometimes not. Uh, smaller give rise to larger. Again, that, sometimes, sometimes not. Uh, simple give rise to more complex. Does that sound kind of good? I like that one. More complex give rise to simple. No, it doesn't go that way. It goes the other way. Oh, and here's what I told you. Stay away from this. Weaker give rise to stronger. Not, we don't like this language. So, yes. C is correct. All right, let's talk about a few evolutionary misconceptions. We're gonna look at these four items here and talk about why these are misconceptions. So a lot of times people will say, well, evolution is just a theory. So when we're talking science, as opposed to everyday lingo, that in science, the term theory, law, principle, those are terms that mean there's a ton of evidence by a ton of scientists that the greater scientific community believes that there's enough support and data for this phenomenon that given the current technology, we as a society cannot disprove this idea, phenomenon, etc. cetera. Um, if you were to say something like, I have a theory that since it hasn't rained in two weeks, that tomorrow it will rain. So if you say something like that, is, it, is that the correct use of the term theory? Did the whole scientific community get behind you and say, oh yes, we have tons of evidence to support your idea here that it will rain tomorrow. So a lot of times in like, you'll hear it on um, news, I hear it on like anywhere from TikTok, YouTube to the news, is that in general terms, this is misused. In science, it's as close to a fact as we can get. All right, individuals evolve. So can I change my DNA so that I have different traits or characteristics that allow me to survive better? Can I will my DNA to change? No. So because of natural selection, one of the things about evolution is that evolution is a product of populations evolving. That in a population, there's organisms that might have advantageous traits or not, or maybe everybody has an advantageous trait and everybody survives easily, but any minute the environment can change and it can change who's favored by the environment. So that what we do know in a population, we hope that we have a diversity of different characteristics for different traits so that if the environment changes, that somebody in our population or you know, hoping the majority of our population survives that environmental change that nature selects for someone or hopefully most of us and that we can make it to the next generation. So evolution is a product of change in a population, not in individuals. Evolution explains the origins of life. Yeah. Okay, so yeah, for sure. So when you said um, you can get girls if you want to stay in the water longer? If the environment changes, an individual cannot will their characteristics to change. Meaning, you, I should say, you can't. Thank you. No. You can't, yeah, you can't get gills. I can't just be like, I love being in water. So sorry. Thank you for coming. Yes, you cannot just will gills. I wish I could. Maybe it was my, like, projection in there. Um, yeah, so please change this to can't right here, everyone. Make sure this is a can't. Sorry about that, thank you. Okay, evolution explains the origins of life. We said that in the beginning of this unit that nobody knows, nobody has evidence to show how life started. We have, and we'll talk about hypotheses for that, but um, we don't know. So history of life, 
We'll get to that and talk about that evidence that supports how life may have started, but nobody knows. And then organisms evolve on purpose. Um, again, like I can't just, I mean, I can't just sprout gills or wings if I want to swim underwater longer or fly. Um, evolution happens by chance. That the environment, climate change is constantly happening. And when the climate changes, again, hopefully you have traits in your population that are positive with that climate change and your population goes on. If not, your population can dwindle in number, maybe you settle in at a lower carrying capacity or you completely die off. So it brings us to climate change in the perspective of natural selection. Climate change has always influenced evolution. It's always been a driving factor. Think about climate changing is natural selection. So humans who are accelerating processes of climate change right now, we are the driving force, which means we as humans are agents of natural selection. And what we have evidence for is that humans as agents of natural selection are affecting every species on the earth negatively. Does that make you feel a little guilty? It makes me feel guilty, I know that. So, I don't have to get into this. Last unit we talked about a lot of different ways that the humans are messing up the biogeochemical cycles those are all ways that we are affecting other organisms as agents of natural selection. All right, so we talked about, again about all of this. Um, one other thing that's interesting in terms of being agents of natural selection is that we are causing shifts in the life cycles of a lot of organisms. Uh, if you've heard on the news recently, cases of West Nile virus are showing up in the Chicagoland area currently. West Nile virus, West Nile virus, where is the Nile River? In Egypt, right? And so it's all the way across the world. We should not be seeing this disease here in the United States, but we are. We're seeing that that has spread, that disease that mosquitoes are a vector for has spread to almost every area of the world at this point. And it can be very dangerous, especially for people who have a compromised immunity, or even if, um, let's say that, you know, it's during allergy season, which is right now, and your immune system is fighting off some allergen, and you get West Nile virus, your immune system is already a little bit compromised. And even if you're a healthy person, that could cause you to get very, very sick or even die, which is, you know, odd for a healthy person. The other thing that we're seeing in terms of mosquitoes is that because we are having warming in our area of the world, mosquitoes, which used to have one life cycle per summer, because our warming period is much longer, we're having, they're having two life cycles. So I know, like, I've noticed that I will get bit by mosquitoes in, like, March, as well as the other, like, yesterday, got bit by a mosquito. And that is really odd to be getting bit by mosquitoes in March and, you know, mid-September. Um, because we now have influence to life cycles by climate change. Mosquitoes are vectors for other diseases as well, like malaria. Malaria is another disease that because mosquitoes are having more life cycles, as well as they are spreading to other areas. Do you not have that? Oh, okay, sorry. So this is on the top of the next page. Thank you. That diseases that are carried by mosquitoes are breaching areas of the world that they never have before. All right, and this little squirrel, very cute squirrel. This squirrel, which is found in Canada, the red squirrel, um, it is starting to produce offspring 18 days earlier than it did 10 years ago. 
So this squirrel has an advantage over other species that live in that area, and it's allowing the squirrel population to expand, to have biotic potential 10 days earlier, or what was I, 18, sorry, excuse me, 18 days earlier than other species. So they're starting to spread quicker than other organisms that they normally would be having greater competition with. And then one more example is the snowy owl. And areas that had snow almost the whole winter, like our winter last year, for example, we didn't have much snow. And so there's two alleles for feather color that you have the one that's more brownish and the one that's, uh, sorry, the one that's more whitish and dark brown and the one that's more brown. That what we're finding is that when there's a lot of snow, they can blend in with the bark of trees better. But with less snow, the more brown with no snow on it, that they're surviving better. So where when there was more snow, they're more favored. Now the color that's more favored is going to be this color. So females are going to choose mates who are this coloration as opposed to this coloration now. So you'll see the allele percentages changing over time in populations due to changes in climate. And like I said, humans are agents of natural selection that are having a negative effect on every species on the planet. So let's get into population evolution in more details. All right, so let's talk about what a population is. A population is a group of organisms that are the same species, who live in the same place at the same time, and can potentially interbreed one of the very important things in terms of evolution for a population is that species who are a population that their mating pairs can have fertile offspring. We are going to see that, and I know I've mentioned this before, that reproduction, successful reproduction, is a very important part of evolution so that it can keep a population going. All right, so. What it comes down to is when we're looking at evolution and traits, we're looking at what genes are found in that population. What are all the different versions of a gene, which we call alleles? So like the owls, for example, have the darker coloration or the, the brown coloration or the white coloration. Um, those are different alleles that are found in their gene pool. So a gene pool is the sum of all the different kinds of traits, alleles, in a population. Variation is very important. So as I've mentioned, that there are alleles for traits, and it's the different versions of those traits found in the genetics. So little reminder of what we mean by some of these terms in genetics. But we have two chromosomes of each kind, we call them homologous chromosomes. Where do you get the two chromosomes from? One's from whom and whom? Good. One's from mom, one's from dad. And what we have is we have gene pairs found on the two different homologous chromosomes. Um, those gene pairs can be exactly the same from your mom and dad, as we see here and here, or they can have different versions like one could be coding for green and the other one for yellow. What we call the different versions of a gene is we call them alleles. So an allele is a gene, but alleles show all the different versions that are available in that particular trait. Okay, so again, what does it have to do with evolution? We're going to take a look at genetics on Thursday in lab 
and over a period of time, we could take and track, like for example, we could look at the concept of complete dominance in our genes, and what that means is that you have a trait that has a dominant allele and a recessive allele. The recessive allele will be masked in the presence of the dominant allele. You can have the dominant trait by having two dominant alleles, or a dominant and recessive allele, or two recessive alleles. When you have two recessive alleles, you express the recessive trait. So we could track the percentage of dominant alleles now, percentage or frequency, same thing. We could track them generation one, and then we could look a thousand generations later and see do those allele frequencies change over time. And if they do, that does show that evolution is happening. So again, when we say frequency, we mean percentage. What percent of dominant alleles do we have? What percent of recessive alleles? And this is a great mathematic way to show that evolution is changing. So we had all those different pieces of evidence for evolution. This is another means of supporting that evolution is happening in a population. So when we say allele frequency, it means the percentage of a dominant or the percentage of a recessive. So let's do this mathematically. Let's say that we have 100 pea plants. We're going to look at the genes that control flower color. Remember that we have two genes for a trait one from biological mom, one from biological dad. So if you have 100 plants, you are going to have 200 alleles. You're gonna take that 100 individuals who each have two alleles for a trait. So 100 times two gives us 200 alleles for flower color. If 50 of those alleles for flower color code for white, what's the frequency or percentage of that white flower color in the population. Now, you gotta figure out percentage. So percentage, you're taking the number of particular alleles, divide, divide by the total amount of alleles. And what'd you say? Uh, 25. Yeah, good. So when you take that 50 for white flower color, out of 200 total alleles in the population, 50 divided by 200 gives you 0.25, thank you, or 25%. Another piece of evidence that we have for evolution are mutations. When we say mutation, all mutation means, by definition, it's a change in the allele frequency of DNA. Or, excuse me, it's a change in the allele of DNA. Mutations can be nothing. They can be good. They can be good. Or they can be bad. A lot of times when we think of mutations, we think, oh, mutation is bad. But we're all like major mutants. We all have, like if we just think about the mutations for eye color, and if we just like suss it down to something very simple and say, that there's green, blue, and brown eyes, we have three different traits there for the characteristic eyes. So we all, it depends on, we'd have to you know, like track back, what was the original trait? And then two other ones are mutations. They're mistakes in the copying of the DNA from parent to offspring and come up with two different alleles. Now, for the most part, Let's say like blue eyes. Do people with blue eyes, do they die because they have blue eyes? Is there an advantage over one of the traits as opposed to the other two? Green, blue, and brown. So brown has more melanin. Melanin protects your eyes from harmful UV rays. So you do have an advantage to have brown eyes 
But having blue or green eyes, is it lethal? No, it's not, not that big of a deal. Put on a pair of sunglasses, right? It's not that big of a deal. So mutations, which are a change in the base sequence of the DNA, it's a mistake. It's a simple mistake and copying of the DNA from parent cell to offspring cell. We're talking about just like in our general cells or where it concerns evolution is when you're producing egg and sperm because then you get mistakes that are passed on from biological parent to offspring. Mutation, so let's go back to the definition. It's a change in the base sequence of the DNA molecule. So um, let's just say that blue was the original trait for everything that had eyes. And um, what happened in a population, or maybe various populations, is that there was a mistake in copying the A's, T's, G's, and C's for blue eyes. And what that mis mistake resulted in is that maybe instead of ATGC, you got ATCC. And when you had ATCC, what popped up as an expression of that DNA code was brown eyes. So now you have a new trait. We call that a mutation because it's a mistake in the copying of the DNA. What that mistake did was it allowed for, it caused more melanin to be captured into the cells of the eyes. It, it will remain hereditary because it's in the base of the DNA and we pass on DNA from parent to offspring. So mutations can be hereditary if they're passed on in sperm and egg. That a mistake that the parent cells in making sperm or making egg, that mistake is passed on. It's inherited by their offspring and then that stays. That mutation is kept by the offspring. So then the offspring can pass it on to their offspring, and their offspring, and their offspring. That makes sense. Well, I mean, like, there be specific genes and specific cancers that would also be considered mutations? Yes. So in some cases, it could go the other way, where you have a cell, and in the production of the cell, the gene that goes for replication of that cell has a mutation, and it malfunctions, it causes a malfunction in the replication of that cell. So then that cell, instead of replicating every, like, let's say two years, it's now programmed to never stop replicating. And that's a cancer cell. So then how does the distillation mutation play into that if they were to, like, remove or, like, change with the DNA, like, surgically? Um, so a deletion, there's different kinds of which is interesting. Um, deletion, mutation, where some of the nucleotides are deleted, it's the same thing. It can cause for the expression of the trait to be the same, it could be like equal, it could produce the same outcome. It could cause the outcome to be bad, it could cause the outcome to be beneficial. So it just depends on what that code says you're gonna make, what the instructions say. Yeah, so it's interesting. It's um, the mutations, the mistakes. It's hard. You can't predict what they're going to be until the instructions are like lived out in the cell. Yeah, it's a yeah, fascinating, crazy stuff. That's one of the things. Like, um, if you were to get a like at UIC, they have a master's degree in molecular engineering. That could be something that you study. Is that the outcome of mistakes in certain traits? Perhaps they um, cause cancer, and then you're looking for the way to block that cancer. Um, there's a lot of different means, or could be that in molecular engineering, you're just looking at comparing the um, heredity of a certain trait, like cytochrome C, over many species, and you're just tracking that. So there's a lot of applications for that. Yeah, good, good questions. So one of the things about our cells is that our cells do have mechanisms for correcting mutations, but here's the thing about cells. When a cell is going to replicate, 
when you're making sperm or egg, or you're making just like any cell in your body, what a cell has to accomplish is so much. The, let's say that the, in, our, in humans, the egg or the sperm, the nucleus, the amount of DNA that's going to be passed on to offspring, um, let's say that that amount of information in that microscopic cell is equivalent to like 10 of your notebooks that you have in front of you. Let's say that that cell replicates in 20 minutes. What is the likelihood that 10 of those books copied in 20 minutes are gonna go perfectly? Not real likely, right? Like, that's a lot of information. It's like asking you, if I said to you, that book, I need you to copy it, hand write it out completely, perfectly by Thursday, would you make any mistakes? Probably, right? So the likelihood of making mistakes is very, very high. Um, we do have mechanisms, or they call them checkpoints, to check. Like, did all of the A's, T's, G's, and C's, did they copy perfectly? So that's one thing. It's like a spell checker that they'll check over. But if you have a huge volume of information, you're probably going to make mistakes. You're probably going to miss things, right? So there's one place. Um, other things like in the process of moving the chromosomes around the cell during cell reproduction, that you have to make sure that all the chromosomes have lined up perfectly. Well, there might be a mistake that happens there. So there's checkpoints that kind of like do a little check, but the checkpoints don't always get everything perfectly. And during the process of cell reproduction, there's only three checkpoints. The likelihood that mutations are gonna get through is pretty high. So that's just been a natural part of the evolution of every species on the planet, is that mutations are very likely to happen, and that's the way it goes. So mutations, that other thing about mutations is that we can't control what piece, like if, if I had you all, I said you have to write out your textbook by Thursday, is it likely that all of you are going to make the same exact mistakes? No, right? No. So it's so random, like what mistake you're going to make as opposed to what mistake you're going to make as opposed to what you're going to make, right? And so there's just so many means of the possibility of new traits to enter into a gene pool of a population. And it's all, is any of it by will? No. You're like, when you're rushing to do something, you're not gonna be like, I'm, I mean, you know, occasionally it might happen, but for the most part, if you're rushing to do something, when you make a mistake when you're rushing, you're not like thinking cognizantly, I am going to purposely make this mistake. Things happen, right? So that's the way evolution goes, is that things happen. And when things happen, like mistakes are made, especially in copying the DNA for sperm and egg, that there's no intention to it, and that intention, that mis the mutations that occur, could be nothing, could be like code for the same thing that they were gonna code for originally, or they could make the organism's trait worse, or could make them better, and which of the three possibilities happens, you don't really know. There's no intention to that either. So there is no intention to evolution, that it is totally by chance. So the fact that humans in the form we are in today are here and dominating the world in the way that we are is a total mistake. It's just by chance. So evolution's pretty wild. It's pretty wild on the earth that we have such a diversity of species that we do. Like, how does this all happen? So, when we're talking about mutations, mutations can code for a very similar thing. There are some like very interesting mistakes that have occurred over time that give us the ability of what we call a triplet base pair to code for the same trait that when we have like an ATG, and an ATC and an ATA, that those three, the changing of one nucleotide may code for the exact same outcome. But in some cases they may not. 
So we do have a little redundancy built in that just happened by chance too. So there's just a lot of like wacky things that have been by chance happened. And that's why when we get into molecular biology, that it's really fascinating that what people are trying to do is they're trying to decode all of these different mistakes and especially in the context of the benefits for humans, remember that we talked about ecosystem services, that we are often looking into both ourselves as well as other organisms to benefit us, right? We're trying to crack the code of, not only like it mapped out the human genome, but we don't know what everything in the human genome means. And so you, one of you, or all of you, could go into the field of like molecular biology and you can look at a certain portion of a gene to try and figure out does this cause a disease? And if it does cause a disease, you start researching what is the cure for that disease. But first you gotta know what it means. What does all the DNA mean? So there's a lot that we don't know. So remember, when we're talking about these mutations or mistakes, that mistakes can be, again, nothing. They can be bad, but they can also be good. Did we miss something back here? Eliminate, maybe? Sorry, I probably went as usual quickly. I mean, mutation happens by chance. I think I skipped that. Well, come on. I know I skipped that. So this is just, to me, it's just like super wild that we're here. All right, so. So mutations are very important for evolutionary change. Mutations are important for providing different traits, different alleles, different characteristics. And it's all totally by chance. If the environment changes and we have mutations and do they match up so that it's beneficial? Sometimes, but when there's enough of those traits that aren't beneficial given the change, species can die off, go extinct. They can level off at a lower carrying capacity. They can experience harsher environmental resistance. Could be better. Could allow them to survive easier. But you never know. You never know with evolution. You never know with climate change. So if there is a trait that allows organisms in a population to survive easier, the percentage of that trait will start to increase over time. That in general, the females are going to choose the mates who have an easier time surviving because they want what's best for their offspring. So they're gonna choose a mate with good genetics, good survival skills. When we're talking about mutation in the lens of evolution, the most important cells to be affected by mutation are the sperm and the egg. For example, what's not important is, let's say in one of your heart cells that you have a million heart cells and you have a cell that is starting to like go bad and it starts to replicate cells to replace itself and it replicates cells that have a mutation that doesn't allow them to function at all. Out of a million cells, one or two cells that have the inability to function in the heart, is that a big deal? If you have a million cells and a couple don't work, not a big deal, right? 
But if you have an egg or a sperm and they code for a malfunctioning heart, is that a big deal? For sure, right? So when we're looking at evolution, mutations are most significant when we're looking at the cells that make the offspring, the sperm and the egg. And then, whatever mutations you have, the environment selects for whether you have an easy time surviving, you have traits that are beneficial, and you might have some traits that are beneficial and some that are not beneficial. You have a mix of things, and we know one of the factors in evolution is that competition, the less competition you have, the easier time you have surviving. So the more beneficial traits you have, the easier time you'll have surviving, but certainly everybody has traits that are not beneficial given the current environment. Let's take a look at this question. Most commercial pesticides are effective for only about two to three years. This is because new pests invade the area. Maybe, right? That's a, that sounds like maybe. The chemicals induce mutations that convey immunity. I mean, maybe. It sounds great. Chemicals mutate. We're talking about genes mutating, so no. The pests learn to ignore the chemicals. I mean, maybe. And then those pests with advantageous mutations will survive and reproduce. Yeah, that sounds a lot more like what we've been talking about. So here's like a whole field that needs constant research because of the evolution and selection of organisms in regard to changing in climate, these pesticides need to be created over and over and over again. All right, so remember that adaptation just basically means the genes you have. Are you well adapted? Do you have genes that are beneficial given your current environment, or do you not? Adaptation does not mean I can adapt like, you know, like for humans, we are adaptable, right, so that you know, like you, for example, you have a lot of different professors who have different rules, and you adapt to the different rules. That's not what genetics means. What it means when we're talking about evolution is that you either have, you have whatever genes you have, and they help you to survive or not. That's adaptation. All right, the term fitness. Sometimes evolution by natural selection is called survival of the fittest. Fitness does not necessarily mean you're strong. Fitness means, I mean, we've adapted that in human terms, right? Fit people, you go to a fitness class. It's about, we think about it as getting stronger, but we don't use those terms in evolution. Um, fitness means that you are able to survive easy and have a lot of offspring. That's what fitness is in regard to. So we have adapted the term fitness in a really weird way in our everyday lingo. If you are fit, yeah. So when it comes to the whole having a lot of offspring thing, does that go per like species, like within the amount of species you can have, like a lot within specific species, or just as a general? Yes, but also. And in, in, um, it can be referring to like, is the species have good fitness? Are they reproducing a lot? And we can look at it in terms of like biotic potential shows good fitness in an overall population. We can also look at it comparing individuals within a population. If I have five offspring and you have two, I am more fit. So, so yes and yes can be like a holistic or individual thing. So just remember, when we're talking about fitness, fitness just means that you have more offspring for the population. Traits that, yeah. So then, we're considering people who are like, so like, because I think the average for humans is probably one or two kids. So, but then if you are saying like, somebody has seven to 10 kids, they're considered evolutionary more fit? So humans, again, are, we, de we defy a lot of the laws of ecology. 
and of evolution. Because the traits that we, as weirdo humans, value as advantageous are weird for survival, it doesn't necessarily apply. We're talking about like mice out in the field. Mice who have two as opposed to 20, that's a significant difference in fitness. Now humans, we could, um, you could be a carrier of let's say Huntington disease and not know it and you could have 10 kids. Mm -hmm. You have good fitness as a human because you have 10 kids, but if of your 10 kids, nine of them die, early in life before they can reproduce, did you have good fitness or not, right? Because your offspring don't survive. So, um, I mean, humans that we value things like face symmetry, for example, um, that people with more symmetrical faces are often considered more um, attractive, is like we shouldn't, that shouldn't be a big deal. It should be like, uh, I don't even know, humans, because we have, I can't even figure out what we would, I mean, for example, like uh, thin versus being overweight and obese. We should really be valuing people who are overweight and obese because what if there's a famine? Thin people are gonna die first. People who have fat stores are gonna survive much longer. So. Like, we don't look at it like that. Or you mentioned like the wisdom teeth, right? Like, not having to spend a ton of money on getting wisdom teeth out, which is expensive, but also we know damages our jaw. Like, why are we not choosing based on wisdom teeth as opposed to super bright white teeth? You know, it's like weird stuff. So um, humans are just like weirdly different because we can defy some of this law too, or the pr principles, I should say, of evolution as well as ecology. Yeah. So back to natural selection, often called survival of the fittest. You've got a couple terms in there, right? Survival. Survival means you have advantageous traits. Fitness means you have offspring. You're passing on those advantageous traits to your offspring. For survival of a species, it's important to have the most advantageous traits given the environment in the pool of genes that you have as a species. All right, so let's put this in the context of the lab that you're going to complete today. What you all did was you took bacteria now this is a different context than the way you set up your experiment. Um, what they're showing here is they're showing that the red are bacterial colonies up at the top. So all those red dots are different colonies of bacteria. And that this is the antibiotic. So if you want to write down like antibiotic and point to the little dots, that those are the, these red dots here are the bacterial colonies. This is the administration of antibiotic onto three plates of colonies of bacteria. And then you let that sit for a couple days and let these bacteria colonies on three different plates be exposed to the antibiotic. And what you're left with on each of the three plates is you're left with four colonies of bacteria. So what that means is that these bacteria colonies have genes for resistance to this particular antibiotic. So in the presence of that antibiotic, these bacteria have an advantageous trait. What if we give a different antibiotic? So now we have these, right? Let's say we give them a different antibiotic exposure. Let's say that this was tetracycline. Expose them to tetracycline, they survive in the presence of tetracycline because they have genes for resistance to tetracycline. Now let's say that we expose them to ampicillin. And 
let's say that's your outcome. But now, in the presence of ampicillin, these colonies here, let's say it was this one, that just by chance that these colonies, after being exposed to one antibiotic and then a different antibiotic, that these, just by chance, also have traits for resistance to ampicillin. Now, what if it's another antibiotic? Maybe it's tetracycline, or maybe it's, um, I can't think of another one. But if it's another one and they all die, then it just depends on the environment and what you happen to already have genes for. So, like, these ones here, okay, they're exposed to tetracycline, and out of them, four colonies survive. Did, these bac did the bacteria play up there? Did the bacteria originally, did they anticipate that they were going to be exposed to tetracycline? They didn't know, right? So they didn't plan to, poof, make a mutation for resistance to tetracycline. Just like these here, that these four colonies, they didn't plan to be exposed to ampicillin and poof, 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 make resistance to ampicillin. You have what you have. You have the genes you have. And when the environment changes, if you survive those changes, lucky you. If you don't, that's the way it goes. So you have already the set of genes or traits you have. You don't will them to happen. They're all there by chance, by mistake. And if you survive an environmental change, that's great. If you don't, it's the way it goes. So evolution is just like a random, by chance thing. So let's answer these two questions then. A bacterial allele that conveys resistance to the antibiotic streptomycin, well, there's another one, is always beneficial to the bacterial cell? Okay, if streptomycin is not present, is it beneficial? It doesn't do anything, right? It's not bad, it's not good. So it's not always beneficial. Is beneficial to the cell in the presence of streptomycin? Yeah, right? Like you have a gene for resistance to that antibiotic, then it's good when you're exposed to that antibiotic. Is neutral neither beneficial nor detrimental to the cell? No. Is beneficial to the cell in the absence of streptomycin? No. Is always detrimental to the cell? No. It's beneficial when streptomycin is around and not. So having the gene for resistance to streptomycin is beneficial when you are exposed to streptomycin. Otherwise, you have a trait that's just nothing for the time being. All right, bacteria get their resistance to antibiotics because they are in the presence of the antibiotic and mutate to become better suited to living in that environment. Can you will a mutation? No. Because antibio the antibiotic causes the mutation? What causes mutation? The mistake in the copying of the DNA from the parent cell to the offspring cell. The environment, which is the antibiotic, does not cause the mutation. So no, because of that, because some of them just happen to have a mutation to the antibiotic already, survive and pass on those advantageous genes to their offspring. That sounds pretty good, right? Because the environment influences the bacteria to have the mutation, this, this is basically saying the same thing as B, no. Okay, so well, this is correct. I highly encourage you to have this section of the lab open when you're writing up the lab to remind you of the wording that you need to use for the lab today. One of the things about especially evolution is that it's not just about using vocab words, it's using them correctly. So I've had students write interesting things with lots of things like evolution, mutation, natural selection, fitness, and they put it into a sentence and it means absolutely nothing. So this is really good, this section, to know what your wording should look like. 
All right, so environment selects for those that have genes that they can survive in that environment. It's kind of funny wording, because it's not like the environment picks. It's just a matchup. Like, in the environment, if you can survive that environment, that's good. Somebody settled on saying the environment selects for you, but you just happen to have something that matches up. So I always like to think it's like they match together for survival or they don't match together for survival. So mutations, again, cause variability. Variability, the more variability is good in case in the future you have a lot of changes to the environment. We're seeing that right now with climate change, and we'll give some examples, I think next time, when we talk about ways that it's like, being very similar is not good. So when you say the environment plus the trees, does that mean like natural selection, like what spatial? Yeah, nature selects for the advantageous trait, but again, I like to think of it as like matches. Like you have traits that match survival in the environment or you have traits that do not match survival. So select is a kind of a funny term. All right, other modes of natural selection. So we've got mutation. Let's talk about other things that influence it. Another thing is called gene flow. How you share genes with other populations. So members of the same species, they live in different places, but they meet up. So for example, let's say that we've got mice on the prairie and we've got mice in the wetland across 107th Street. And because cars go down 107th Street, the mice never cross the road. So you've got two very separate populations. Let's say the college buys 107th Street and no cars are allowed to go that way anymore. And they make the street into a natural area. So that barrier is gone, allowing the mice to meet up now. So now you've got genes that can flow from the population on that side and the population on this side. They can mate together. That's what we mean by gene flow. That two different populations, a population means they're the same species, and they can now mate. allows the populations to become more similar. They share more characteristics or traits. I should say versions of a trait. All right, another concept is called genetic drift. Sorry. So genetic drift means that populations are going the other way. Gene flow, they're coming together. Genetic drift, they're going away from one another. Uh, genetic drift can be caused by a couple of different means. One is, is that there's like a geographical barrier that comes and it separates the population in half, or a third and two thirds. So that it takes the diversity of the population and it limits it possibly. So what does that all mean? Let's say, for example, that we have a population of mice, and if we're looking at the concept of complete dominance, that the capital B codes for brown, or black, I should say black, and the little b codes for tan. So in a population, something happens where the majority of the population gets separated from this one and this one. So they're the only two left. When you make big B, little b with little b, little b, it allows for offspring to be this in the next generation. So visually what you see is that from generation one, three quarters of the population was showing the black trait, one quarter was showing the tan trait, but in the second generation it's half and half. 
Now we've increased this recessive trait by a quarter. All right, now let's say that something happens again, that these two get separated from the population. And now by the third generation, the diversity of our population has completely changed. From having two different possibilities of the trait for fur color to having only one possibility. So that is genetic drift. We'll talk about the two causes. So one is the population bottleneck. Population bottleneck means that there's something really bad that happens. Could be a geographical barrier, could be humans, like let's say that Maureen Valley decides that the field out there, they're going to get rid of for a parking lot and that two mice survive out of the whole population. It might limit the diversity of genes that that population has. Could be that they're hunted, that species are over hunted for specific traits. When we're looking at genetic drift, typically what you find is a reduction in the variation in the population. So gene flow often allows for more variation. Genetic drift goes in the opposite direction. All right, so here's just like a, another visual example. That in a population, let's say the gene pool has these four different major traits and you just randomly turn that bottle over and you take 10 individuals out could happen that of those 10 individuals they're only representing two of the four traits so by the next generation you've limited from having four different traits to two different traits so another um, one example of this is the northern ele elephant seal in the 1800s. They were almost hunted to extinction, and the individuals that were left were only about 20, but those 20 individuals were almost exactly genetically identical. Because hunting was outlawed to protect the elephant seals, these 20 we're responsible for the population increase back up to 30,000. But here's the bad thing, is that even though you have a lot of these individuals, they're very closely genetically related. So if you have a disease that pops up that makes them susceptible to that particular disease, the likelihood of them all dying is pretty high. So that's not good. All right, and then the last thing I just want to talk about is the founder effect. Founder effect is when environmental resistance kicks in. Survival's getting hard for everybody in the population, and a group says, let's get out of here. If a group within a population decides to leave, the likelihood that they are very similar is very high. Just like humans, you might find that, like, for example, I shouldn't say, like, let's just say, um, so if you have a group and they see everybody experiencing environmental resistance and they're like, well, this sucks, let's get out of here, their survival skills given the current environment are probably very similar because they're like, well, we all are surviving better than everybody else. Let's take our good survival traits and let's go elsewhere. They're probably very similarly genetically. So they leave together. If they go to another area, like the elephant seals, how the numbers dwindle down if they're a small number and they experience some kind of natural selection, could wipe them all out because they're very genetically similar. Also, depending on what genes left and what genes were left behind, you might see very different alleles favored in the new environment, so they start to differ much from the original population in a new environment. One human example is um, there's an Amish population, I think they're in Pennsylvania, um, that they kind of like chose to live a different way 
um, than the rest of the human population, a lot less technology, for example, and their way of life. And one of the things in this population is a disease called ellis van Creveld syndrome. Um, one thing that's, I think, beneficial is that they have an extra finger. So that would be good, because like you could grasp things better. Um, the bad thing is, is that it codes for like a shorter trunk area, so you don't have like enough space for your organs. It can have a really negative effect on your systems. Okay, so there we will stop. So today we're writing up lab 22. Hold on to lab 21. We will work on lab 21 